I think it's fascinating that the most important part of a plant, the root, is the part that we rarely see. Very often, the root is a storage organ that nature has designed to get the plant through the winter. And it also gives us a lot of good eating all winter long, too. I'm Barbara Damrosh. And I'm Elliot Coleman. Stay with us for the next half hour, and we'll get you to the root of vegetable growing. On Gardening Naturally. It's hard to say when the root crop season begins or ends. Does it end when I dig the parsnips in the spring, the last of them after a long winter? Or does it begin when the garlic that I planted last fall comes up? Or did it begin last fall when I planted that garlic? Good question. I think that's because the root crop season is year round. For example, Along with the parsnips, I've just harvested some of the last of the overwintered scallions. And I've done that at about the same time I'm transplanting in this year's new onion crop. I do that differently than most people do. I plant my onion seeds in a soil block, and I plant four of them to a block. Now, if I were to do it the way I used to do it, I would have little individual onion plants, I'd make a furrow, I'd lay them in there at the right distance apart and bury them like that. But I've found it's much more efficient to start my onions four seeds to a block. I'll usually get three or four uh, vital plants in there and then set them out in a grid about a foot apart each way. Now that's the same spacing for onions in a bunch a foot apart as I would have if I put one onion three inches apart in the row. The advantage of this is it's much quicker, and once they're growing, I can cross-cultivate in both directions like this. There are no in-row weeds, and I find that the onions push each other apart just slightly, and there's a wonderful wreath of onion at each site at harvest time. Now, these are fairly young plants. I only started them five weeks ago. That's another thing I've learned. Back in the old days, I think I started my onions much too soon because I was always trying to get large plants. So when I put these out, I put them out a lot earlier, but I put them out under protection, something I never used to do for onions because I always thought onions were so hardy. And I found that putting them out under a little bit of protection like this gets them off to a much better start, and eventually they're going to grow much better onions for me. The climate in here is warm enough so that these onions don't suffer any effect from the early cold winds They'll grow bigger and stronger, and then I have nicer plants at the time when they start to set the onion bulb at about the time when the days start to shorten. Now, this is a nice hint because I can use this cover and the hoops later on for other more tender crops. I have a lot of other interesting things I've learned about growing root crops over the years, and we're going to take a look at a bunch of them. stored root crops in your root cellar, you notice that by spring, this starts to happen. They start to sprout like this carrot or this rutabaga or this daikon radish, which has gone to great lengths down in our root cellar. Now, this isn't very appetizing growth. It doesn't have any color. It doesn't have any nutrients. You wouldn't want to eat it. But we have a technique of sprouting these indoors in the warmth and in the light so you actually get something that's good to eat. And we don't wait till spring. As soon as we've got root crops, we'll start sprouting them indoors throughout the winter. Now, this is a beet, which I've chosen because it's nice and big, has a lot of stored carbohydrate in it, and it's showing very encouraging signs of sprouting. So we're going to start with that one. I've got a nice deep pot that will hold the whole root, and I've got some potting soil. Any good potting soil will work, but I like to use one that has a lot of peat moss in it because it will help to hold moisture and encourage that root to sprout. I'm just going to put it around the plant like this. 
doesn't matter if you get a little bit on the top. It'll sprout right through. Poke my fingers down there to get rid of any air pockets and go lump like that to firm it up. And then I'll water it, put lots of water in there because anything with peat in it really absorbs that water. And there we are. Now I'll do the same thing with this celery root. This is a knob celery or celeriac which is grown specifically for the root. But you can also sprout greens from this too. Now again, I've chosen one that shows signs of sprouting and I can put it right in a pot like that, same size, with plenty of room for the root. Now you can even do this with a cabbage. This is a red cabbage that we pulled out of the garden, roots and all, and store them in the root cellar. I'll bring one up and cut off the top, put that in a cabbage soup, and I'm going to sprout this root. Now I'm going to pot this up just the way I did the celery root. Nice long pot, put it in root and all, fill it with soil up until about where the little sprouts are going to come out. Now let's look at some results. On this bright window, this celeriac is starting to send out celery looking leaves. We start these in succession, so some are always a little ahead of the others. So when they play themselves out, there's more coming along. In another week or so, I'll start snipping the celery leaves for salad or soups. This beet is coming along nicely. In another few weeks, I can harvest a few beet greens. And look at this magnificent cabbage plant. It's sprouted all along its length from all those little nodes. Beautiful green leaves with red ribs. And in another week, these little flower buds are going to bloom bright yellow. And I can even snip those flowers to cook along with the leaves, just the way you would broccoli rob. What a magnificent house plant. I kind of like to think of this as root crops turned into salad crops for the winter. I'm standing next to a sweet clover plant, taller than I am, and some winter rye that's almost that tall. And they look pretty impressive. From the ground up, this is a lot of growth and something you're going to say, wow, isn't that a neat plant? But the reason I'm standing here is to tell you that the neatest part of this is the part you never see, the roots underground. And without roots, there wouldn't be anything up above the ground. That's a simple statement because the roots are down there feeding on the particles of the soil and taking in water that nourishes the plant. But there is so much going on underneath the ground that as humans wandering around and just seeing the surface vegetation, we miss wonder and miracles galore. In fact, one of the best books about this is entitled Roots, Miracles Below. Another one is entitled Living Earth. And that's exactly what's going on. The earth beneath our feet is an amazingly live place basically because it's filled with roots, and roots that you wouldn't believe. I mean, if you had x-ray eyes and could look down there, you would see more intertwining and intermingling roots, more excitement and growth and competition. It is really one of the miracles of our planet that we've only learned to see this part of the vegetation, and we really know as little about what goes on under our feet as we do about what goes on under the ocean. And so I dug a hole so we can investigate what's going on underneath, what's going on with the roots. Now, the man who inspired all of this was a professor who studied roots of plants for many years in the Midwest by the name of John Weaver. And John dug holes deeper than I did. In fact, he traced the roots of alfalfa down nine feet and more at different ages. In fact, they found some roots of alfalfa eventually went down 40 feet if the soil was good enough. Pretty amazing work and fascinating as to how the roots grow and fill the soil. Well, my roots aren't going down 40 feet, but that's because this is especially significant. This is a very poor soil. It was only recently cleared out of the woods. We've just begun sowing green manures on it. And as you can see, the good black soil only goes down about four inches here. Beneath that, it's subsoil. But slowly, as we get lime in and improve the growing conditions of the soil, the roots are going down, and the roots are the key to improving it because they're making passages that earthworms can follow, organic matter in the soil. They're opening it up as they expand. They're moving the particles aside and letting more air in. The power of roots to move objects is absolutely startling. According to statistics, a tree root only about two inches in diameter can actually lift a 50-ton 
bolder as it expands. And studies in laboratories with just one single rye plant, and I have a bunch of rye plants that I pulled from the field, showed that after four months, one single rye plant in a pot in a greenhouse had a total of 7,000 miles of fine roots and root hairs. 7,000 miles. Well, these haven't got 7,000 miles, but you can see from how fine the roots are that this is an amazingly productive system for investigating all the little parts of the soil to find food for the plant, to support it, and to provide all that growth up above that we like so much. Now, I've done a little archaeological expedition here. I've been scratching away at this to, to expose these roots. And you can now see that the top root of this goes down. I've broken it off. Given what I know about roots, that probably goes down another six, eight inches, even in this poor soil. And over time, the roots will get deeper in there, add more organic matter, and begin taking the nice dark colored soil further down in there and give me a good, deep, rich loam. And the, therefore, the miracles below give you the miracles above. Now, that's the practical aspects of roots. And next is the culinary aspect. I'm going to show you some of our secrets for growing great edible root crops. There are six small seeded root crops that I plant generally in the garden. There's carrots and parsnips, radish and rutabaga, beets and celeriac. And most of the time, I can just go out and plant them anywhere where I would plant anything else. But over the years, I've gardened in five different states and on a lot of different soils. And on some of them, I've had problems with one root crop or another. So one year, I did a trial to see if I could figure out some secrets for overcoming those problems. I took a part of the garden, and I divided it into strips. And I tilled different soil amendments into each strip. I had some autumn leaves. They got tilled in there. I had some seaweed to till in here, maybe some horse manure over here, some old hay from the barn there. And then the next spring, I cross-planted, so the rows ran across each of those strips, all the root crops that I was interested in. And I learned a lot of very interesting things. For example, if I'm having trouble with carrots or beets or radish or rutabaga, they really respond well to tilling under autumn leaves the fall before. And I'll just go out and rake them up, even go over to the neighbors asking you to rake their yard if you don't have enough on your place, bring them in, and just till them into the soil so they're thoroughly mixed in with the soil, and they'll spend the winter there. They'll break down, they'll start to decompose. Next spring, mix them in again, and that's where you'll plant those four crops. Carrots, parsnips, radishes, and rutabaga. And you'll find that if you're having trouble, this isn't a bad way of overcoming it. This is a nice stimulant for them. Now, beets and celeriac don't like it there. But what beets and celeriac do like is some seaweed. Beets, because they're a seacoast crop, celeriac maybe because it likes all the extra trace elements. If I'm having trouble with beets and celeriac, I'll go get some seaweed meal like this, or since I'm near the coast and I can get the real thing, and I'll put that where I'm planning on planting them. Mix that in with the soil, either the fall before if it's real seaweed or in the spring if it's the seaweed meal. And then when I plant beets and celeriac there, I've always found that that extra bit of mineral somehow gives them the boost that overcomes problems. For other crops, specifically the rutabaga and the radish that need a little extra nitrogen, since they are planted at a time like the rutabaga, middle of the summer, like turnips, so it's maturing in the fall, I find that alfalfa meal, this is just ground up alfalfa leaves, is one of the best fertilizers I can use. Especially if I want to grow midsummer radishes. If I spread this, again, mix it in with the soil, and keep my planting of radishes or rutabagas nice and moist so I've given them a perfect nitrogen feed with the alfalfa meal, that makes a big difference to them. Now, with the celeriac, one last thing to remember. This doesn't go in as seeds, this goes in as transplants because it takes a long time. But being a relative of celery, it likes the moist soil. And so after I put a celeriac plant in the soil, I want to remember to irrigate that spot more than I would otherwise. are plants with big fleshy root systems. They don't do well in very warm climates, but in most of the parts of the country they're very easy to grow. They come in delicious colors ranging from white to pink to red to purple. 
sometimes a big ball of petals, sometimes with a more open center, often very fragrant. They grow on about a three-foot plant that's nice and bushy with a good yellow fall color. Now, the thing about planting peonies is to choose a sunny, open spot, and then make sure that when you plant them, these pink buds are not too far below the soil surface, about an inch or two. Now, what I've done is I've dug a deep, round hole here, and I'm going to put some good compost in it, like that, and then fork that in. And then I'm going to firm that with my foot so that when the peony's planted, it won't sink deeper and put those buds too far down. Now, if I set that down there, I can see that that is already too deep. So I'm going to add more soil and more compost until I've got that level just right. Okay, now I'm going to add some compost to this soil, mix it all in, and then gently fill in around those roots. There, that should do it. Those probably won't bloom the first year, but after that, I'm going to be enjoying peony blossoms for many years to come. I enjoy growing my own potatoes because they taste so good from the home garden. And if you share my passion for good potatoes, you'll be interested in this tip. One thing I put in the soil for potatoes that I don't put in for any other crop is rotted sod. And this is made just by taking old sod, putting them in a pile for a couple of years, and rotting them down. And what I get is this beautiful dark matter filled with roots and filled with fertility. Now, normally I can tell you why something works. I can't tell you why this works. All I know is that it does work. And farmers have known for years that if they plow up an old grass pasture and plant potatoes there, they'll get an exceptional crop. The old Irish farmers used to do a method called lazy beds, where they would actually turn sod over on itself from either side and then plant potatoes down the center of the sod. So this is one of my key materials for growing a good, healthy, and delicious crop of potatoes. I spread it on as thick as I have the rotted sod to spread on all over the bed that I'm about to plant potatoes in. And then using one of my typical tools, I will just mix it in with the topsoil when I'm preparing the bed for potatoes. At that point, I'm ready to plant. And the easiest way to plant them, I find, is with a bulb planter like this. Say I'm going to put them a foot apart down the center of this bed. Well, I can judge about a foot apart. I just take the bulb planter, make a hole, and you're ready to drop in the potato. But before we do that, we need to talk about seed potatoes. Because the part you're going to plant, the seed potato, is exactly the same as the potato you eat. The only difference is that you have let it sprout. Now, sprouts come out of what are called eyes on the potato. Look at that. It actually looks like an eyebrow and an eye. And when they come out, they give you a little plant that looks like this one that has already started to sprout. There are, on a potato, an action end where there are a lot of sprouts and a tail end. You can actually see the old tail here. This is where it was attached to the potato plant when it grew. Well, the action end is where the most vigorous eyes are. You don't need to plant the whole potato in too many plants there. You need to cut it. And it's best if you can cut it into pieces with about two eyes per piece. So if I were looking at this one, I would probably plan on cutting across here and cutting across there, and I'd have three nice pieces out of this seed potato. And so I just cut them like this. Now I have three potato pieces, each with two eyes, ready to plant. And at that point, I just then do drop it in the hole about three inches deep, cover it with soil, and move on to the next hole. Press in the planter, drop in the potato, cover it with soil. Now, if I weren't into the perfect potato, the pampered potato, this would be it. But I am, and there's another step. I've always found that potatoes grow best where there's some food coming down from above, plant food. And so I like to, at this stage, put on a layer of compost. Now, this isn't finished compost. This is a partially decomposed compost, and that's fine, because on the surface of the ground here, it will keep breaking down, and every time it rains, food will be going down into the potatoes. Now, at this point, I'm going to wait, because 
I want the potatoes to emerge. And in a couple of weeks, maybe longer, depending on the weather, the first little sprouts of potatoes, looking very much like the sprout on this potato that's already started to grow, will be poking through the ground. And at that point, I do the final step for the real perfect potato crop. I cover them with mulch. Now, I have some over here that I planted three weeks ago. And a week ago, when they first emerged from the ground, I put this straw over them. And you can see the same process that I was mentioning before. There's the old rough compost on top. The reason I put this here is because there are two other things that are really important to potatoes, a cool soil and a steady supply of moisture. And that's what the straw ensures. Now, as the potatoes grow out of here, I will push this in closer under their stems, but basically that's it. From now until harvest, they just grow. In a way, we've hardly begun with root crops. There's an unending variety of them that you can grow in your garden. Yeah, we grew some sweet potatoes this year and some daikon radish. Look at the size of that thing. Horseradish, which actually isn't a radish at all. Jerusalem artichokes, which is a marvelous vegetable, and even some parsley root. And of course, then there's always salsify, scorzonera, burdock. We could go on and on. But for now, goodbye and good gardening. Next on TLC, get started on easy home projects that anyone can handle here on Homebodies. Then indulge your creative side with Debbie Stapley on Crafts & Company here on TLC. Thank you.